James and for Carol, and to celebrate the journey. Our service today is for him. And we want to pay tribute to him. We play, he played many roles during his time in this world. He was a devoted husband, a devoted father and grandfather, a friend to all. He celebrated veteran of the United States Air Force for, for 20 years. And that you are gathered here today to honor him, the testimony, the influence he had upon your lives. So on behalf of the family, we thank you all who are here today to help grieve Jimmy's loss, but yet to honor his life. It's an important day when, whenever we stop to bear witness to a person's life and to use and the time that he spent among us to honor the difference his living and his dying made to family and community and to take the time to express our grief and our hope and our prayers, our wonder and our memories. It is equally important for each of you to recognize that this simple ceremony today of farewell joins the universality of death with the uniqueness of human life. Even though Jimmy is no longer physically present, his lessons, his love, and the many memories you have him. Recording in progress. So the family thanks you on behalf of Jimmy. Today. I'd like to begin with a passage of scripture from the 23rd Psalm. This is a familiar passage. Many of you probably memorized this in Sunday school when you were young. But it brings comfort to us today. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Should I the yeah. my, my, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Shall we pray? Shall we pray? Dear God, we open up this service today with a sincere plea for your strengthening and your grace. Each and every one here is dealing with the loss and the pain of this dearly beloved man. Jimmy, and we ask today that you will be very present. Some of us are weakened by the pain and grief. Others are struggling through sleep deprivation or even mental stress. Use the strong to encourage and support the weak in our midst. And above all, be our shelter today. And as family and friends come to share their thoughts about Jimmy for the last time, Help them to stand strong, give them peace of heart, and support them with your grace. Amen. As the Roaring Twenties drew to a close and the world entered a new decade, the Wall Street crash of 1929 had prompted a rather depressing start to the 30s, and while we while the hope and prosperity of the 20s seemed to have dissolved, 1930 was still a year of interesting and positive events. It was a year of great hardship and yet great accomplishments in our world. Major news stories included the first of the great, the first year of the Great Depression. The prohibition enforcement is strengthened. The uh, Graf Zeppelin airship completes its flight from Germany to Brazil. The tariff, the Smoot-Hawley tariff bill is signed into, into law. Public works programs begin. 1930 was the first year of the Great Depression. Television was just starting to gain momentum. 
but the high unemployment rate of 8.9% caused problems in every area of life. This was felt worldwide. It was during this year, 1930, this year of unrest and hardship, that Jimmy was born. He first started out living on the streets, trying to survive for about a year when he did end up being in an orphanage where he was cared for from age 9 to about 18 years old. When he then joined the United States Air Force. His first job in the Air Force was as a sanitation specialist. And through a curious nature and a, and a bright mind, he quickly earned his GED and associate degree while serving in Okinawa, Korea, Japan, Germany, and Alaska. He met the love of his life, Susan, on a skiing trip. Susan was a nurse at the time, and he got he got hurt there, didn't he, Susan, at that? And you and you helped it, you, like his hand, wasn't it? But uh, when Susan and Jimmy saw each other, it was love at first sight. They took to one another immediately, and they became a couple. A courtship developed, and Jimmy had to return to Europe and Germany for work, and he proposed to Susan before he left. And he was relocated to England, and Susan took leave of absence from her job and flew out to meet him again and to marry him. They were husband and wife for 33 years. She describes life with Jimmy as a wonderful life. They traveled as a couple to many countries, such as Budapest, Czechoslovakia, and they eventually settled back in Sacramento, where they made Citrus Heights their home for over 23 years. On their 30th anniversary, Jimmy and Susan flew out to Hawaii, where they renewed their wedding vows. Jimmy found life a marvelous gift, and his talents won him promotions and an entrance into the aerospace arena, serving satellite installations around the world. Upon retiring in 1969 as, as a, a sergeant, sergeant major sergeant, he was awarded a Bachelor of Science degree under the GI Bill. A second career awaited him as he became project control manager for the NATO AWACS project, project with a German aerospace company, and then director of international operations for a worldwide newspaper company. Jimmy attempted retirement at age 63, but he was coaxed into working with IBM managing a new project with California Child Case Management Systems. And at the age of 72, Jimmy closed the book on his working career and opened another of bicycle riding, skiing, golfing with friends, and his family. His active life kept him slim and fit and his demeanor was loving life every day as a gift. When asked how he achieved such, uh, such success in his life, he attributed his training, his education, and many opportunities made available to him as a member of the U.S. Armed uh, Services and as a citizen of the United States of America. Jimmy and Susan loved to dance, especially ballroom dancing where they would use their living room as a ballroom floor. Jimmy also loved jazz music and the big band era music. He was an old Western and great classics TV watcher. His favorite channel to watch was Turner Classic Movies. Sadly, life caught up with Jimmy, and in his 91st year of life, just a couple of months ago, he was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, he had been having trouble with his back. And three weeks later, his journey on earth ended. Jimmy had a Catholic faith. And though he didn't practice it much as in his adult life, his faith came alive during his last days, and he asked for a priest to be with him. He is survived by his family, brother in Baltimore, William Farrell. Three children, Brian, Teresa, Michael, and James K. Farrell. Stepchildren, Lorna, Scott, grandchildren, he has 16 grandchildren and eight great great grandchildren. We thank God for his life. 
We thank God for his service to his country, and we are grateful for the memories that he left and for his family and friends here to cherish those memories. Memories are very important. Memories are God's way of giving us peace of heart when we grieve. It's kind of like laying your head on a soft pillow at night to bring comfort and peace. So I want to encourage you to keep sharing the memories about that with each other, family and friends alike. And some of you, uh, all of you who are here today, I heard it better than you know. Someone's character is very much determined by the number of friends he has, or she has. And this speaks very highly of me today. So come share your memories with the family today. Keep sharing those memories with you. Tell your stories. For as long as you keep those memories alive, keep them alive in your heart. Another thing that's very important is that family is so important. Family is to be cherished. In times like these, we are reminded how much uh, family means to us. So take the time today to say an extra I love you. And you could go tell a family member or several or many how much they need to cherish your family. And the third thing is, Jimmy left quite a trail, a village trail for others to follow here. There's a man that was enthusiastic about life and enjoyed adventure. That's Nancy and Sue in the front, is it? Love and was devoted to his family, his wife. And his he buries head at the end. Love right the front, right? He uh -huh. enjoyed every day of his life. So we are very grateful. And we need to look at sometimes what kind of life uh, trail is my life leading for others to follow. You know who's not there? Jimmy lived every day of his life. And we thank God for his life. For his service to his country. It could be his hands. His devotion to his family and friends. And memories he left. We want to give an opportunity now for uh, several family members who want to come forward and say a few words. Don't be in too much of a hurry. you would have heard my eulogy of her, it being about my relationship with her. Today I intend to do the same with my father. Dad was born in May of 1930. To start off with my dad, it's important to know about his childhood, which was just mentioned. He had a, uh, a nice early childhood while his dad worked as a brick and stone mason in upstate New York for a wealthy man. But then the depression hit and his dad lost his job. At the age of eight or nine, Dad and his younger brother Tom and his younger sister Peggy were living on the streets in Brooklyn, New York, along with thousands of other kids. By the way, two of Tom's children are here today, Thomas and Danny. And one of Peggy's children is here today, Chrissy. We'll see them later. My father spent the last nine years of his childhood raising an orphanage along with Tom and Peggy until they left to join the Air Force in 1948. When asked about his experience in the orphanage, he would say he was very well taken care of, but that he was not raised with much love. In 1955, he was stationed in Minot, North Dakota, where he met and married a farm girl, Imelda Merck, in 1956. As he would say of the Merck family, it was the first love and caring he had experienced since he was a young boy. Five years later, after being married, they brought into the world Jim, their fifth and last child. Well, we were all one year apart. I was first, then Tim, who passed in 1981, then Teresa, Mike, and finally, sometimes called Little Jim. In the Air Force, Dad was in radar, and eventually in missiles, and was gone a lot to isolated stations around the world. In 1964, things began to settle down when he were, uh, we were stationed at Vandenberg Air Force Base in Santa Barbara County. I was an eight-year-old, and Dad began to be around more, to do more things with us. In Vandenberg, Dad signed Tim and me up in Pop Warner football. He didn't coach, but he was very involved. In 1967, Dad was transferred to Los Angeles, and he prompted, 
promptly signed Tim and me up in football and baseball. And Dad was an assistant coach with my football team. Teresa, a cheerleader, and Mike and Jim, mascots. And Mom, in charge of keeping it all together. It was as if Dad was having the childhood he had never had. When we retired from the Air Force in 1969, Mom and he moved us to Carmichael, California to be near Grandma and Grandpa, uh, Merck, in Lodi, and to start a business with uh, Mom's brother, Don Merck, and Don's friend, Bruce Hagen, both of them educators. They called their company IREX, the acronym for I for Industry, R for Research, E for Education, and X for the Unknown. In Carmichael, Dad began, uh, Dad again signed up Tim for me and me in Pop Warner football where Tim was the star running back and both of us in baseball. And Dad was an assistant coach most of those years until I aged out of Little League. However, my last league year, Dad was the head coach. At tryouts, he picked kids of his team based not so much on their ability but on their drive and their attitudes. Dad absolutely loved to coach. More than that, he was a teacher, and he primarily wanted to teach us how to play the game of baseball. My best friend, who lived across the street, Mike Lee, who is here today, I think, uh, was on our team, and we won the league with 19 wins and one loss. But coaching wasn't enough for Dad. He was also our assistant scoutmaster. All four of his sons made Eagle Scout, and he went on countless backpacking trips with us as well, which you will see in the slideshow, I think. Again, I think Dad was living the childhood he never had, and we loved it. In high school, Mom and Dad usually went to our cross-country races and an occasional track meet. Scott Ellis, one of my running buddies, is here today, and I think he's here. Uh, Dad loved talking with Scott. In 1976, over one year out of high school, I was pretty aimless, having played sports my whole life and spent thousands of hours in the outdoors playing. I wasn't very motivated. Mom and Dad said to all of us, either go to college or go and make your life work. I certainly didn't want to make my life work yet. Do you have a job? So I went to American River College basically so I could still run track and cross country under Coach Al Beta, one of the greatest men I've ever known. He was just a complete breath of fresh air. I wasn't motivated to study, uh, upset that I never had a girlfriend in high school not knowing not one either in college. And though I had a, a whole team of guys I ran with and did things with, I felt quite depressed about my future. And I knew mom and dad were going through some tough times that Irix wasn't going as planned. One day, dad and I passed each other in the hallway at home, and I said, Dad, I'm going through some tough times right now. And his response was, so am I. And he walked away. I, it didn't take, I, <laughs> I didn't take it personally. <laughs> I knew he was going, what he was going through, and I felt for him and mom. A couple weeks later, I was driving our VW van, and dad was in the passenger seat on Ferrox Boulevard, and we weren't talking, we were just silent. All of a sudden, I started to cry uncontrollably, and I couldn't stop crying. Dad said, let's drive over to Ava Way, which was an empty street next to our street. This is the day my dad became my hero. He said, what's going on? He just listened to me, asked questions. After about 45 minutes of talking, he said, you need to go and join the Navy. See the world, learn about life, and make some money. He knew the Vietnam GI Bill was about to end with amazing benefits. So a few days later, after we talked uh, with, to mom about this, Dad and I went to the recruiter together, and on December 21st, 1976, I joined the Navy. Dad insisted that I go into electronics. It was said it was the way of the future. My electronics school didn't start for another year because it was so impacted, so it wouldn't be until August of 1977 before I went to boot camp. He also knew that if I went in with 45 college semester units after boot camp, I would have three stripes. He said, you have to do that. So he made sure I did. He became my biggest cheerleader. It seemed like forever for August to come, but when it did, Dad took me to the bus station where all of the new recruits assembled. I said my goodbyes to Dad, boarded the bus, and we drove away. I noticed that Dad stood out on the sidewalk when the bus departed. And I looked back, and Dad stayed on that sidewalk and watched 
about a sleeve until we were all out of sight. After boot camp in San Diego, mom and dad came to my graduation. I had two weeks of leave off, and on the day I had to return to the Navy, it was my 21st birthday, November 8th, 1977. Each of my siblings handed me a little gift as I was going out the door. When I got in the car, I started to cry uncontrollably again. I knew I was leaving for good. Dad reached over and put his hand on me and said, Brian, you're going to go far in life. When I arrived at my first duty station, I called mom and dad and we set up a time and I called them every single week. On Sunday night, they would listen for the phone to ring twice and then stop. That was their cue to call me at the, play, at the pay phone on the base, first in Memphis, Tennessee, when I was in electronics school and then in my jet squadron in Jacksonville, Florida. Both of them wanted to hear everything, how everything was going, and I loved telling them. Then of all places, while in the Navy, with all my track buddies uh, saying, hey, you're going to have a, a girl in, in every port, uh, a friend explained the gospel to me for the first time. It was in the Navy that I committed my life to following Christ with my whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. There was a base ministry and a great church nearby, and I started to attend. The man in the ministry staff, Don Bowley, took me under his wing and guided me through my new faith. And I was, I'm still in touch with him today. I quit drinking and partying with my buddies and started to learn what the Bible was all about. I was blown away by it. I started reading books by great men and women of faith. We would be in port and instead of me going off the ship, I would just stay in my bunk and read all day. Dad couldn't understand why I was so interested in this and he and I had some difficult times about it for a few years. But we found some common ground as well. About, Dad, um, about God. Dad's business in Irix ended while I was in the Navy, but Irix led all three of the partners into a much brighter future. Dad used his GI Bill to finish his BS degree and with his skills in the Air Force and his contacts made in Irix, they led first to the incredible job as a project manager, as mentioned earlier, with Boeing Aircraft and a German company. And then in England as project manager of the newspaper printing press company. And finally in IBM. Whenever Dad, I, whenever Dad and I could get together, we did. While I was in the Navy on cruises in the Mediterranean area, I was able to take leave to visit Dad when he lived in Germany. And another leave when he lived in England. Then in 1988, on another trip to visit Dad in England, I met and began my friendship with Susan, whom I love and appreciate so much. Jump ahead from 1977 to 1982. I'm recently out of the Navy, back in college with a completely new mindset about school at Cal Poly. I met a young lady I liked, Alexis, AKA Susie. Uh, Dad drove me, drove down to meet Susie and her mom, Edith, who's here as well today, in 1983. And Susie and I were good friends while she went off to Mills College, then York, England, and finally in Oxford, England. We finished our degrees, mine in environmental biology, hers in history. Then we got very interested in each other, obtained teaching credentials, and got married in 1990 and started our careers in education. Jumped to 2006. Susie and I were teaching on the U.S. Army base in Ansbach, Germany. While there, I was selected as the Presidential Science Teacher of the Year by the National Science Foundation for all the Department of Defense, Defense, all the Department of Defense schools around the world. Alexis and I were awarded a one-week trip to Washington, D.C., along with other teachers represented from each state. We had a group picture taken with President W. Bush. Mom and Dad flew over for the ceremony as well. Again, it was typical of Dad that he was there. With that award, each teacher was given $10,000 to spend however we wished. Susie and I bought 10 acres for our, our cabin in the woods on the prairie in North Dakota. 34 miles from where my mom was born and near where my dad met my mom. Dad loved it. This was where he developed his love for the outdoors, back when he was stationed there from 1955 to 1959. On our yearly trips back to the States every summer, the boys and I would invite, um, would invite family and friends to join us in North Dakota. In 2007, Dad joined Susie the kids and me to survey what we had. And we built a bunch of birdhouses that we put up all over the 10 acres on fence posts and trees in the shelter belt. In 2008, Dad joined my nephew Shane, my brother Mike, 
and my boys and me to reinforce and stabilize the large barn on the property. In, two in 2010, Dad joined my brother Jim, my sons and me, to help a company move an old house that was going to be burned down. Built in 1915, it is a 2,100 square foot, two-story farmhouse with a tall roof and attic that was delivered to our 10 acres. It was epic, and Dad took on the self-designated job as official photographer as we meandered through narrow dirt roads between farmland, squeezed through narrow roads between ponds, and down hills on side slanted roads where the house seemed to be teetering on the verge of falling over. And I have a video, hopefully we'll see of that too, that Dad made. In 2011, we hired my brother Mike and his crew to build a wood foundation with a walkout basement on our hillside facing the lake. In 2012, Mike and I went out there when the company rolled the farmhouse on rollers onto the foundation that Mike built. In 2013, Dad and I drove out from California to scrape all the old paint off the house and barn and painted both of them. It was our most monumental task and Dad, being a vegan, didn't eat enough food and lost about 10 pounds. At 83 years old, Dad, Susan, and I decided that it should be his last trip out to build it with us, but certainly not to stop visiting. I cherish all those times I had with my dad to see him living our dream of our summers in paradise in North Dakota, with all the wildlife, birds, ponds, wildflowers, grass, green grass under thunderclouds, and at the night, at the right time of the year, waterfall, fowl, migrations like you've never seen. This past April, I drove up to Sacramento, picked up my dad, and spent six days with Susie and me in, Sac in the Tascadero. We went to the beaches, out to the Carrizo Plains National Monuments, watched birds at my bird feeder in the backyard, read books together, and scanned more and more on his slides. Then I drove him back to Sacramento. It was a great father-son time. In June, I picked dad up and took him up to our favorite place in the Sierra, where we knew the area like the back of our hand during our Boy Scout days. We took short walks around the nature area, walked through our Boy Scout camp, which is still functional but was empty, and talked about our days at summer camp, the backpacking trips we did, the merit badges he taught, reminiscing about the scouts we knew and the stories he told at the campfires. Back at our camper, we read our books, sat around the campfire and talked and watched for birds, drove to restaurants in the area for dinner, and looked at the quarter acre Susan and I own in a, in a nearby mountain town for some future cabin. Going back in time, in July of 1981, Mom and Dad went to a marriage retreat. While there, Dad wrote a 12-page declaration of what he believed about life and about God. Dad brought his declaration on our camping trip. He read it to me a few years before while we were working in North Dakota. My faith was very different from Dad's 12-page declaration of faith. When he read it to me a few years ago, we had a lot of disagreements about what we think about life and God. But we both gave each other the freedom to believe differently out of respect for each other. This past summer on our camping trip, he gave it to me to read out loud. I read it out loud without voicing any disagreements. It was a time of complete acceptance of each other. On our way home back to Sacramento, we were talking about everything we did the last six days. Eventually, Dad asked me what I believe about God. He just listened. When we arrived at his home, before I finished, I said, Dad, we'll have to finish this another time. He said, okay. December 1st, 2021. I received a phone call that Dad was in excruciating pain in the Veterans Hospital at Travis Air Force Base. I departed early the next morning and spent the day with Dad, Susan, and Teresa, waiting to find out what is wrong with Dad. The news was not good. Dad had cancer in his lower spine, kidneys, and bladder. But Dad took it as a matter of fact, and he wasn't going to fight the cancer. When I left that evening with Susan to take her home, I told Dad, Dad, you know I still have some things to talk to you about the Lord. He said, I'm receptive to that. Teresa was able to stay and spend the night with Dad. The next morning, a number of us arrived at the hospital, Susan, Shane, and Teresa, and we spent the day with Dad, hoping hoping he could check out and leave because he wasn't going to fight the cancer. During that time, along with Dad, we were all instructed about hospice care. Late at night, we heard that Dad had to stay the night for, the, for more results from his tests. Susan, Scott, 
excuse me, not Scott, Susan, Teresa, and I left late that night while Shane spent the night with Grandpa. The next morning, we received a phone call from the Shane that he was allowed to transport Dad back home and put, wow, put under hospice care. Once he was there, Susan's son-in-law, Barry, Shane, and I helped Dad into his hospice bed. I made sure all thing, all was well and I, that it could be, and I drove home back to my family. The next weekend, Susie and I arrived Saturday morning as I had signed up for watching Dad through Saturday night to Sunday morning. Susie and I had the whole day with Susan and Dad, and Susie got a really nice cognizant time with Dad during the day. I was next to spend some time with Dad, but he was pretty sleepy. I told Dad, Dad, I still have some things to finish with you about the Lord. Dad said, I'm open to that. I told him how I come, how I came to be a follower of Christ. I told him that because he and Mom raised us in the Catholic Church as we grew up, I had a reverence for God and therefore responded to the gospel when someone explained it to me. We had some laughs together when I reminded him, as a family, uh, we were that we were great law keepers, going to church every single Sunday, did all the sacraments, that we said the exact same prayer our whole lives before dinner, but as fast as we could, Mom and Dad included but that we never once talked about God as a family or to each other. We chuckled together about growing up in that way. And he fell asleep. I closed the blinds because it was midday and I turned off the lights and left the room. After he had a good long nap, I went into his room quietly in the dark and knowing this to be the last time to answer his question about what I believe, I knelt near his bed and prayed for about 15 minutes, praying the verses Jesus talked about what it means to believe in him. I know there wouldn't be a lot of time. I sensed that this would be the last time I could, would see him. I turned on the lights and opened up the blinds, which woke, woke Dad up. I talked with him a little bit, then I asked Dad, can I finish what I was going to tell you about the Lord? He said in a weak, quiet voice, yes, please do. As I shared each verse with him, I asked, do you understand and agree with that? And he said, yes, after each verse I shared. At one point he said, this is really heavy. And I said, yes it is, Dad. Are you following with me? He said yes. Though he was getting sleepy, I said, Dad, since you agreed with me with all these verses, will you pray with me about what we just went through? He said yes. So I asked him to pray with me by repeating after me as I prayed. He prayed with me through, uh, he prayed with me, though there were times he asked, what did you say? So I would repeat it, and he would pray that. When we finished, he fell asleep. Shortly after, Susie and I packed up thing, our things, making sure it was ready for Shane to spend the night, and then we drove home. Indeed, it was the last time we saw Dad. Dad loved the outdoors, hiking, backpacking, sailing, running, bird watching, coaching, bicycling, fishing, playing football, watching football, watching the Olympics, he loved the Air Force, his family in their military uniforms with him. He cherished his five kids and all his grandkids and all his great grandkids. I'd like to finish with this. As a young boy scout, when I was about 12 years old, I was on a backpacking trip with our troop and probably with Dad. As we were hiking, we came across a vista that was absolutely gorgeous, and we all stopped to stare at it in silence. One of the scouts who was a little older than me all of a sudden said, how can anyone say there is no God? My response to myself was incredulously, people say there's no God? Dad often said that he experienced God in nature. Thank you, Dad, for instilling me the awareness of God through his creation. And so here is a verse that I think Dad would appreciate that describes the reason for his love for the outdoors and his search for God. The book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that we are without excuse. Thank you, Susan, for your loving care of Dad always, but especially in, in these recent years. I miss you, Dad. We miss you very much.
Those of you who know me as Mike. <laughs> I wanted to share one of the most important things my father taught me. Forgiveness. He forgave his father who left him in New York. Many years later, my dad took him in to our family, forgiving him. And that's, like I say, it's one of the most important things that, that I ever learned and to that degree. I just wanted just to say that, uh, obviously, Jimmy was my dad, but he was my friend, good friend, and I'll miss him here. My name is Jim. I was Jimmy, Little Jim, and many other names. It's an honor to be able to stand here. I'm not going to be able to do this very well. But we've got some funny stories that I had with my dad. Um, some, when I was very young, we lived on a dead end street. The name of the street was called Bolin. And we were on the last house on the right. And there was no street lights, it was very dark. And at Halloween, my dad would dress up so my, my mom was wears my mom's wig backwards so that the hair was in his face. And in order to get to our front door, there was just a small walkway that he had to walk by. And there was a giant juniper bush that kind of was overgrown and was on that sidewalk. To get to the house for the little kids that trick or treat, they had to walk by that. And dad would be hiding in that bush. <laughs> so when the kids came by, he would jump out and scare the heck out of them. But that's the kind of guy he was. He was, he, he was living life. Um, another time I was. Uh, I had, he was living in Germany, and I moved to Germany and lived with him for a certain amount of time, almost a year. And one of his friends was a mushroom expert. So he went on a mushroom hike to find wild mushrooms. And it was uh, a big deal. It was, it was the German, if you know any Germans or have you ever been to Germany, they were, Pretty serious folks. And this guy was really into finding these mushrooms. <laughs> and we found a bunch. We gathered a bunch and uh, brought them to his house. And he started cooking them, sautéing mushrooms. And he would cut them and put them on the table. And we would eat them as samples. And uh, my dad went and walked up. And he grabbed one of the mushrooms and started eating, them, eating the mushroom. And the guy said, you didn't eat that one, did you? <laughs> and, and he thought he was going to die. <laughs> and he was just really freaking out that he had eaten this mushroom. And it was the first time that I had ever seen a prank pulled on my dad. <laughs> so I was dying. <laughs> then another time, um, I went on a couple of hundred mile bike rides with my dad. And he was an avid rider and was in really good shape. And he would ask me, Jim, um, we got this race. This, it's, they weren't racing, it was just a 100 mile ride. And he said, Jim, you want to go on this ride with me? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go. And I hadn't been on a bike in probably five years. And so I get on the bike, and uh, he gave, he, it was his bike, he let me borrow. And we went on this hike, this ride. And, I was in terrible shape and there was no way that I was going to make it. I was, I don't know what mile it was, but I was telling my dad, Dad, I can't make it. I'm not going to be able to do it. And he kept on encouraging me. He said, no, Jim, you can do it. And, um, we, at, 
one of the checkpoints, my brother Mike, was meeting us. And so we knew that we, want, we at least, I, I knew I at least had to get to this checkpoint where Mike was going to be. So we finally get to the checkpoint, and Mike is there waiting for us, and we pull up, and I'm sure I look pretty bad. And, uh, and I told Mike, I said, Mike, I'm finished. And the whole time, Dad is supporting me. He, he could have done it with his eyes closed. But he's like, yeah, Jim, no, no problem. You want to stop? We can stop here. We might set his truck. We can get out. It's not a problem. We, we, we can stop. And he supported me in that. Uh, I know that he wanted to complete, and I wanted to get off that darn bike. <laughs> and we, we got to the checkpoint. Mike was there, and I told Mike, I said, Mike, there's no way I can finish. And Mike said, Jim, you are finishing this. <laughs> And he pulled out an 800 milligram Vicodin or whatever it was. He said, take this and you can finish it. <laughs> and both my dad, me and I, we both took one and we got on our bikes and finished that route. <laughs> so, thank you, Mike. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> so, my dad loved music. And when he was in the military, and I think when he was stationed in Korea, he was actually in a band. And he played the, the bass fiddle. So it was a stand-up bass. And he played that. He taught himself how to play in the band, showed him how to play. And so he enjoyed music. And he instilled that into us as children. And we grew up at a very young age uh, listening to big band music. So some of the some of the I can't remember the names of the bands, but he had real to real tapes. As some of the kids that grew up on Bowling Steve probably remember those tapes. And, you know, so he, he would bring these this stereo out and put it on the backyard on the patio, and he would play uh, big band music. No, another one that I for some reason really sticks in my mind is he had a couple albums that were marching bands. And he would, he would play those, and it was just really beautiful professional marching bands playing these, and just albums of them. I really, that reminds me of him. Um, another, uh, so another fond memory of music with my dad is I remember, I don't know how old I was, I'm not even sure where it was. It might have been in Vandenberg or it might have been in Carmichael. But we were all out in the backyard pulling weeds. And he had his reel-to-reel -reel going, and he had, this is probably in the early, late 60s, he had Creedence jamming. <laughs> we're out there pulling reed, weeds to Creedence Curl, Clearwater Revival. I mean, up, 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 his, uh, the guy loved life. <laughs> it was a good band. So I have a couple bands here that I have listed down that, I, that remind me of him. So I've got uh, Creedence, Jim Croce, the Eagles, Cat Stevens, uh, Gordon Lightfoot, Willie Nelson, Ozark Mountain Daredevils. There was a song on one of those albums was called E.E. E. Larson. If you ever pull up an old Ozark Mountain Daredevils song, album and find it, it's a, it's a hard find, song to find, but it's called E.E. E. Larson. It's a, it's a great song. He loved that song. And uh, Neil Diamond was another big fan of his or he was a big fan of, and one of my, Neil Diamond might have been a fan of this guy. <laughs> Neil Diamond, is a particular song is called I Am, I Said. If you can't get a chance to listen to that song, it's, it's a pretty unique song, because Neil Diamond is from Brooklyn, New York, and he sings about Brooklyn, New York, and kind of how he's moving through his life. Um, and during those times, I remember my dad, he thought he was pretty chill cool. <laughs> he, what I remember, he went through a phase where he wore his belt, instead of the belt buckle being in the front, the belt buckle was on the side. <laughs> That's how cool he thought he was. <laughs> yeah, he was growing his hair long, and he, he, he thought he was pretty hip. He, he, he probably was pretty hit. I was, I was a young kid. So it, my, my relationship with my dad 
uh, was strained. And we didn't always get along. As a matter of fact, we didn't get along for a long time, we didn't get along. And we broke, our relationship was broke. And the, and it was for years it was that way, where we didn't talk to each other. I didn't call him, he didn't call me. And it was hard. And as a young man, life is moving. And so he and I didn't talk much for a very long time. And, but eventually as I started getting older, he wanted a relationship with me. And it wasn't me that was reaching out to him. He reached to me and he would call me, Jim, I just want to hear your voice. And I wouldn't call him back. And it was for whatever reasons. And so what he, our, our last years, multiple years for the last 15 years or so, his and my relationship was great. And the reason why my relationship with my dad was good was because he reached to me. I wasn't reaching to him. And that's who he was. He wanted that relationship with his son. And it was very hard for me, but he was persistent. <laughs> and eventually, my dad and I became very good friends. And I would, he would come to my house, and I would go at the end, I would go pick him up, and we would come over to my house, and we'd uh, have a pool in my backyard, and we'd sit in the pool. And what, we wouldn't even, we would just enjoy life, and we would talk about the old times. And we talked about fun, the fun times we had, and we never really got deep. You know, I wasn't raised that way to talk deep, and he didn't talk, he wasn't a deep talker either. <laughs> but it was just good to be in his presence. And we could have good communications. And we would sit there and I would play songs after songs on my playlist. I'd have this portable speaker out of the pool. And we would listen to the song and laugh and think of the memories that we thought of when that song came out and just laugh. And he and I, laughed a lot. We, we enjoyed life. He, he was that kind of a guy. And so it, his drive was to have a relationship with me because family meant so much to him. He didn't have a family growing up. So family was every, everything to this man. And what the legacy that he's given me is to be sure that I do that with my children. And I have five children. And I consciously call them and reach out to them and I have a wonderful relationship with all of my children. And a lot of that is because of what my dad has instilled in me, family. A lot of times when I was sitting out at the pool with my dad, talking and laughing, we're, we would talk about our old times with my dad. And then I can't leave out Scooter. Uh, the Scooter was a good friend of my dad's too. And, uh, he had fond memories of my, of my friend Scooter. So how I want to end this is just at, as children and as parents, it, it is about family. And have that relationship with, be that stronger person that my dad was and that he has taught me to reach out to your children, reach out to your parents, reach out to your mom, reach out to your dad and tell them that you love them because it matters. And it, you know, dad, dad passed away that fast. He got sick and then he was done.
within three weeks. So, you know, you never know. So, thank you for coming, and uh, I'm sure I'll see you around. Call me and say, Hey, Trace, you know, what are you doing today? And, um, you know, I miss him more than any, anything. And uh, I um, was the only girl out of all those four boys, and so he had a different relationship with me than he did the other ones. And um, when I was a teenager, we had a really difficult time. Um, just, I was so much like him, and I just didn't want to be controlled or told what to do, and I just really rebelled. And, um, you know, he, he didn't want to let me go. And uh, he would tell me that, I don't want to let you go. And I was like, I'm going. And I took off when I was young, and, um, you know, I didn't see him very often, and, you know, he would reach out to me and uh, I was living my own life and it was really difficult to not have him in my life um, but as I got older I started to change and my dad and I became really good friends and my um, I had a woman in my life that told me this is what you need to do to have a relationship with your dad. And she taught me how to be the daughter that he needed and that he wanted. I'm so grateful for that woman and she's here today and she knows who she is. I'm also grateful for my friends that are here for me. They know everything about my relationship with my dad. And they know how close I am with my dad. My dad went out of his way to make sure we had bikes and everything we wanted. He gave us everything. And in the end, it was my honor to be able to do the same for him. I went with him to buy his last bike. I went with him to buy his last camera. I was on the other line helping him with his computer every week. <laughs> Trees, I'm having a problem with my password. <laughs> I was like, great, come on over. <laughs> you know, he'd come over in that little white car that he had, and, you know, it was just so much like it was when I was a teenager. He'd have his folder under his arm, and if you know, you know, if you knew, if you knew, he always had a folder, and he had a agenda. <laughs> you know, and um, I was able to be there for him in his last years, and um, that was so important. And I remember when he died that night. He died. Um, I didn't. What, I wasn't expecting to spend the night there, and uh, he lasted another day. <laughs> he was really hanging on, and it was my turn. And I was like, okay. I didn't think that was going to happen, and I was so excited to spend the night with him. And uh, I called my son. And I said, hey, he's not doing well. My son, after he had been working for days, said, I'm going to come over, you know, I'm going to come over and help you out. And uh, he came, and we were sitting there, and it was getting late, and I went to bed. And then I got up to the bathroom, and I looked down the hallway, and I saw my son awake, staring at my dad, writing in his journal. And I went to bed, 
And it wasn't seconds after that that Shane came in and said, Dad had passed. And I went right into where he was, and I crawled into bed with him. I put my arm around his body, his cold body. And I held him for the longest time. And I looked up into the ceiling, and I just waved at him. And I just told him, you're not alone, Dad. You'll never be alone. See, growing up in an orphanage, he felt abandoned most of his life. And I told him that he wouldn't have to be alone. And when I look out at everybody in the, everybody here, you know, I know how much you loved him. And, you know, I, I, I can't thank my daughter enough, Colleen enough for answering my call throughout all of this. Which she always does. But again, a family is everything. And um, I'm so grateful for everybody being here today. It's wonderful to see our family and Susan's family. And last, last I, I really want to thank you, Susan, for taking such good care of my family. You were such a a life support to him, your whole marriage, your whole life, and I'm forever grateful for you. So I appreciate everybody being here and all that. I'm going to end. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren, Susan's daughter. Thank you all for being here. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. Three decades ago, my mom and Jim organized the Critter Tree. They found a tree in the foothills, and one Sunday every December, family and friends met in Auburn for donuts and hot chocolate, then caravaned to our tree. We decorated the tree with food for animals, sometimes with elaborate peanut butter and bird seed concoctions. After our bags were empty, the tree was laden with treats, and the animals were waiting impatiently for us to leave, we all, I'm looking at uh, we all arranged ourselves in a large circle, and Jim pulled a book out of his pocket and recited this poem by Joyce Kilmer. I believe it was his favorite. Jim loved everything having to do with nature. An avid hiker, cyclist, and bird watcher, he was often seeking outdoor adventure. Ice mountain climbing? Count him in. Riding his bike across Oregon? You bet. Organizing golf vacations with the Ohio relatives? Absolutely. Jim made his fun wherever he went. I hope you had a chance to look at the pictures on the way in. You can see him all over the world and enjoying every minute. One of our favorite vacations was a week in London, England, visiting Jim and my mom. He was a charming host, and we were grateful for his generosity. Jim was a world traveler and had lifelong friends from all over. I remember the soup and salad dinners he made when they lived on Eastgate. He was so proud of his recipes. In fact, I saw his soup recipe out front. <laughs> he was always complimentary of my recipes too, even when they weren't so great. My mom and Jim have lots of grandchildren and great-grandchildren. They were very involved with their lives, going to soccer and baseball games, concert plays, graduations and birthdays and wedding celebrations. But he had a serious side too. Three years ago, we were fortunate enough to spend two weeks with my mom and Jim at Bellows Air Station in Hawaii. As we were checking in, I was joking a little with the security police. He did not like that at all. <laughs> there were times for fun and times for behaving. Once we got on base, though, we had a wonderful vacation. We spent our time hiking, exploring, playing cards, and reading. I am so thankful for those two weeks. He loved his family. He loved his friends. He loved adventure. He loved long and thoughtful conversations. He loved chess, but mostly, he loved my mom. He told me how often he loved her and how every time I saw him. I will miss his quick smile, the way he always answered the phone, Jim Farrell, and having him over <laughs> on holidays, he will be missed by all.
you so much. And God bless you. Our prayers are with you and the family. And uh, left behind now, Jim has left behind his family who will feel his absence every day and you will miss him. Uh, such, such a man who made an impact in this world. We're so thankful for him. And uh, each of you today, friends and family alike, are responsible to carry on his legacy. To uh, live your life to the fullest. To live as he lived. With adventure and uh, life is a gift and devotion to family. We've heard today how important family is. Family is so very important. So we'd like to uh, close this, this service today with a, uh, a blessing. And then uh, I'm going to ask John, our funeral director, to come forward and give you a couple of announcements. Okay? Moments of crying together. May each of you today find your own special way to honor Jimmy's life, to hear his voice, to claim his spirit in your heart while being grateful each day for the life and love and example of James Patrick Farrell. Go in peace and love one another in his name. Gentlemen, my name is John. I'm one of the service directors here at Mount Vernon Memorial Park. In a few moments, we are going to carry James to our Court of Honor, where we're going to assemble at our flag area. You'll see where there are chairs and tents. And the United States Air Force is going to render honors, including the rifle team. After that, you folks are invited to a reception on the second floor of our main building. Just go in. There's an elevator for folks who need it. The rest can go up the stairs if you wish. So at this time, I need my urn bearer and my flag bearer to come forward. And when we start to process, would you all please rise? And you may follow us out as we pass by your aisles.
Where's my urn bearer? Where do you go to? In just a few moments, the uh, honor guard is going to be coming forward. time the U.S. Air Force Honor Guard will present honors. Honors will consist of plane taps, the rifle firing team, so prepare yourself for that, and the folding and presentation of the flag. We ask that you stand for taps and play. Place your hand over your heart, or if you're coming for former military, render the proper hand salute. If you would stand, ladies and gentlemen.
President of the United States, the United States Air Force, and a grateful nation, please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your loved ones' honorable and faithful service. John, John's Gospel, chapter 14. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. And Thomas said unto Jesus, Lord, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for your precious, eternal, and unchanging word. We thank you that you are everything to us, the rock of ages, the great I am. In the midst of our sorrow today, we thank you for your comfort and your grace. In the face of death, we thank you for the gift of eternal life. We thank you for Jimmy's life here on earth. And we recognize that the body that lies before us is not his, but rather the house in which he lived. It's not who he was. But we acknowledge that he is with you, rejoicing now in your very presence, enjoying the blessings of heaven. We now commit his body to the earth from which our bodies were originally created. And we rejoice in the fact that his spirit is even with you now. We anticipate the day when the spirit and body shall be united at the coming of the Lord. We thank you, Father, in the days, in the weeks, and the months to come, that your grace is always sufficient. We commit him now unto you, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude our service. At this point, we'd like to invite you to the reception on the second floor of our building. It's a very short walk, right back down the way you came, past the door you came out of, just go to the main entrance mm -hmm. and go to the second floor. On behalf of the family and staff of Mount Vernon, thank you folks for coming and have a good time together and keep sharing stories. Thank you. Texting your friends?